today another video either purposely or negligently retelling the case of Rayshard Brooks. And today we're going to find an answer as to which one of those two things is the motivation behind this video from Trevor Noah. Why did Rayshard Brooks have to lose his life? A simple question with a simple answer, really. The answer being that he showed up drunk as can be, passed out in a Wendy's drive through took over a half hour just to get the guy to give a coherent story, and when he was arrested for clearly driving intoxicated, he decided to resist arrest, assault both officers, steal a taser, and shoot both of them with it. But here we are going to see how we are going to muddy the waters here from Trevor Noah. As you can see, a very discouraging like-to-dislike ratio in that people are positively reacting to the spreading of this kind of misinformation from, again, an encounter with the police officer that is entirely documented on video and should be no confusion about the matter for a very clearly justifiable shooting on the behalf of Officer Rolf. So let's get into the very beginning of this video. You know what's crazy is, here we are. Another Monday. Another Monday in the middle of Corona and in the middle of protests about police brutality. And yet, it's another Monday of another police brutality incident. Like another story. No, it isn't. No, it most certainly is not. This has nothing to do with police brutality. Rayshard Brooks was not brutalized by anyone. Again, we've had videos on this. I'm sure countless content creators have had videos on the Rayshard Brooks video. So, and it's not surprising because so much of the interaction and every available piece of evidence is publicly available. The entire interaction is caught on video. We have audio of the entire conversation. We have the audio of the 911 call. The laws that Officer Rolf and his partner who were unjustifiably charged in this case, those laws are also on the books. They're of public knowledge. It, this is not, by any stretch of the imagination, a difficult case and one where there should be any confusion which side you end up on. But again, because of the like and dislike ratio of this video, there seems to be quite a few people misinformed on this case. Story that has people going how long? How much? When is it enough? The story is out of Atlanta. Rayshard Brooks. Now forgive me if I get any of the details wrong. But first... We are not going to forgive you for getting any of the details wrong. M many of which you are going to get wrong, by the way. And no, no one should forgive you about this. You have millions of viewers. Tens of thousands of people have approved of this commentary on the video. And you know this, and you know the audience that's going to be view this, so we will not forgive you. No one should forgive you for getting this case so egregiously wrong as you did in this video, which we will see momentarily. As far as I know, you've probably seen the video, you've read the story. Yes, Trevor, I've seen the video, and I've read all the stories, the police accounts, the 911 call transcript, the laws on the books that Officer Rolf is being charged with. Again, everyone who comments publicly on this case should be familiar with them. You, however, are not. Rashad was in his car in a Wendy's drive through He was drunk or tipsy or he had a... Had a he was drunk. He was not tipsy, he was drunk. And if you go back and look at a particular segment of them questioning, of the cops questioning Rayshard Brooks, once they actually got him awake, he has absolutely no idea where he is. At one point, he said he's on the Old Dixie Highway. Old Dixie Highway is hours away from his current location. It's not even in the same county of Georgia. He even goes so far as to say once Officer Rolf pushes him, he thinks... He's under the impression that he was pulled over 
along the old Dixie Highway. So not only does he think that he was traveling on a road hours away from his current location, when he is sitting in the car in the middle of a parking lot, he thinks he's pulled over on the highway. He, he can't even understand, he can't even have the awareness to know that he's in a parking lot. He's not on the side of a highway. This is a level of intoxication that goes beyond anybody's possible interpretation of, of tipsy. Alcohol and he fell asleep. Fell asleep, people are driving around his car. And so somebody at the Wendy's called the cops. The cops arrive at Wendy's and, you know, they get Rashad out of the car. And they start talking to him for about 30 minutes. You know, asking him, is he drunk? Why is he driving? What's going on? I... The, com the comment about there being about a half hour or so of conversation is just about the only facet of the story that Trevor Noah is going to get correct. I mean, it seems pretty standard. And the whole time throughout this video, you have human beings being human beings. You have Rashad, who's clearly inebriated, and he's talking to the cops. And you have the cops asking him the questions. And what was interesting about, for me about this video is at, like in the beginning, it seems like everything is going to be fine. The cops are talking to him like a person. They're not being, they're not. For a while, for a while in this interaction, it seemed like everything was going to be fine because for a while, although he was spaced out of his mind, Rayshard Brooks wasn't being aggressive. He didn't put his hands on anybody. He didn't attempt to run away from the scene. For the first half hour of the conversation, it's very easy to be seen that he's going to get taken in on a drunk driving charge. That's a foregone conclusion from the nonsense he was spewing out of his mouth. But as far as aggressiveness is, is concerned, and of course, in regards to the police officers being in any danger or him asserting any force against the cops, it looked like he was just destined to be taken into custody for a drunk driving charge let him air out in the cell overnight not being aggro they're not being disrespectful they're not being mean or anything he's being respectful he's calling them sir he's not he's not cussing them out he's he's offering to to walk home. everything is going well everything. you cannot the, the offer to walk home is a total non-starter you can't simply offer to walk away from your own potential crime scene and, and promise that you'll walk home safely so you can just walk out of an arrest. That's just, a, 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 again, a total non-starter. His, his offer is irrelevant in that regard. Everything is going well. And then in one moment, in just a few seconds, Every part of that normal story turns into the abnormal ending that we've come to know as interactions with police and black people. Yes, the black suspect in question resists arrest, at first engages in non-deadly physical force in striking them, and then takes it one step further and engages in deadly force in stealing a cop's weapon, running away with it, and attempting to shoot both of them with it. It is quite familiar. It's just not familiar in the way that you think it is, Trevor. Because the police try and arrest him. He he resists and he, he wrestles with the police. Not something to be poo-pooed, to, to, to shoo away. That's a central fact in this case. In the scuffle, they try and tase him while he's being... Absolutely incorrect. A, a complete... Bold-faced lie from Trevor Noah. They do not try to tase him. He tries to take the taser off of the officers. Absolutely straightaway incorrect. Tase, he grabs the taser, he gets up, he runs away. And I'm missing a few beats of the story because I... I... No, you're missing very many beats of the story. For instance, the part where he swung at both of them. The part where he tried to take the gun off the police officer's person without being any threat of being shot himself with the taser. You're missing quite a few beats of the story, Trevor. I, I don't want to take you through too much of it, but, but that's... But that's a central problem with this commentary. You don't want to take us through too much of it. What is too much of it? 
the simple chronology of the events is really quite basic. Again, according to the video, a guy was drunk, passed out in his car. 911 was called. Cops showed up. They eventually wake him up. They have a conversation, a drunken conversation on the part of Rayshard Brooks. A half hour of interrogation is done, much more than was needed, by the way, to confirm that their suspicions were correct, that Rayshard Brooks was driving under the influence, and then they attempted to take him in on drunk driving charges. At which point, he wrestled the officers to the ground, swung at them, stole the taser without being under threat of being shot himself with it, shot the taser at the officers, and attempted to run away with the police weapon. The simple recitation of about 20 to 30 seconds of what's on video, that's the story. And you've missed, again, quite a few of those beats, and, and it's not forgivable for somebody in this situation who has a public spotlight, who has tens of thousands of viewers who approve of this content online, millions, I'm sure, in total between the TV broadcast and online replays of the video. As you can see, there's 2 million videos, 2 million views just on the video, not to mention how many people tuned in to Comedy Central when this episode was originally broadcast. It's not forgivable to be this wrong about the case. And this, again, returns to a very simple yet recurring theme with the regressive left. Lying or lazy? Is he lying? Did he see the relevant portions of the video and he's knowingly concealing them in order to push a narrative? Or is he too lazy? Did he hear a black guy shot by white cop, knew he was drunk, and that's just about all the information we need here. Nothing else to see here. I got enough for a video to be broadcast on national television. It's essentially what happens. Rick it's not essentially what happens. Shard runs away. And With the police weapon. And the police chase him. As he's running, he shoots off the taser. Not a... That, that is a, another central lie. In this, look at his arm right here. He shoots the taser. This is almost portrayed as if Rayshard Brooks was attempting to shoot the gun in the air, almost like a like a flare gun kind of motion to either distract the cop so he can fully get away from the scene or simply to just throw them off. Maybe they, they thought they were being shot at, but not really as a distraction device to to get away from 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 their mitts. But this doesn't seem like much, but again, it falls into the ultimate maxim of lying or lazy. We saw from the video that Rayshard Brooks turns his body, arm outstretched with the taser, pointed directly at Officer Rolf. It was not up in the air. It was pointed at an officer after he was already he has already demonstrated that he has no qualms about assaulting each officer on the scene and using the taser against them taser and one of the cops switches his weapons from a taser to a gun and shoots Rashad two or three times in the back and he's dead and immediately everyone everyone goes you know everyone goes to their battle stations that's that's what plagues me about these stories everyone just goes to their battle stations you know immediately people go well once again another example of black people resisting the cops and being criminals and yes Yes, that would be the correct interpretation, but not insofar as confirming a narrative. It's the correct interpretation from, again, reviewing statistics and data regarding crime in America and watching and reading, again, needs to be belabored, the completely publicly available evidence in this case. Why are you driving drunk and why are you running away from the police and what? And then with their weapon after you've punched them and already attempted to shoot them with it. Again, being conveniently left out of the story. Of course, you have other people, you know, in their battle station saying, oh, of course, another story of cops who immediately shoot a black man for 
just sleeping in his car. But like, and it's so ironic, and we'll see in a few minutes here that he attempts to do the nonpartisan guy routine in calling out each end of the spectrum, each predictable narrative. One side saying immediately blame the black suspect without knowing more about the case. The latter of the two narratives saying the police officers were too trigger happy. All he did was drive drunk. He wasn't hurting anybody. He was just lying asleep in his car. And then he will almost immediately adhere completely to the second of those two theories without taking the facts of the case into consideration. Really at the drop of the hat, engages in the exact lazy narrative that he attempted to parse out of this commentary to put aside as as lazy, as, as not cognizant of the facts of the case, which is true, but the ironic turn of events is he does exactly that in the rest of this video. It's messy. No one wants to admit that the thing is messy. It's messy. It's not messy. It's not messy. It's not Lionel messy. It's not messy. The case is very straightforward. It went through the entire series of escalation of, of force that police officers are charged with the responsibility of employing when necessary. It was a completely verbal conversation for over a half hour when it really didn't need to be. After that, they had probable cause to believe that he was driving drunk. He had no idea where he was. He had no idea how to even describe the amount or type of alcohol he had consumed throughout the day. And he was clearly passed out in the midst of driving through the driveway. It was a very simple calculation of probable cause for drunk driving. So after the verbal conversation, they, attend to, they attempt to arrest him. He responded with non-deadly force, namely wrestling to them to the ground, punching them, and at least, even if you want to grant reaching for the weapon before he actually steals it. I think that would be a naive, because what does someone who reaches for a potentially deadly weapon plan to do with that once they gain control of it? But even beyond that, the officers still order him on several occasions to stop, put down the weapon, and he nevertheless runs away with it, and he nevertheless turns around to shoot it again, at which time Officer Rolf shoots and kills Ray Shard Brooks. If this story didn't happen now, maybe we would be looking at it differently, but it's a messy story. It's not the perfect story. And in a weird way, it not being the perfect story means we should look at it in the most perfect way possible. We should try and break it down and understand how something like this comes to be because we don't... You mean, like, review the entire available video of the police confrontation? Like, review the video and the transcript from the 911 call, from the surveillance camera, from Wendy's? Then look at the district attorney's statements, trying to justify the charges against the responding officers, and then putting those charges up against the actual statements of law on the books to see if it's even justifiable to think that you can entertain a, a conviction based on this shooting. Kind of like that. Always have video like this. We don't always have stories like this. We don't even we don't even always look at it. That that's a little kernel of truth that perhaps is saying the quiet part out loud. You don't always have video like this, but this is a gold mine of evidence. Every second of this interaction that's needed for consideration in this case is on video and with audio to back it up. This is a rare occasion where every single piece of relevant evidence you can see. You can watch it. You can replay it again. You can slow it down. This is rare, but it's rare and leading to a conclusion that Trevor doesn't like. like this. But let's just take a moment to talk about what happened. You have, you have a man who is sleeping in his car, right? A man who's sleeping in his car, 
and he's drunk. Was he drunk driving? Let's say he is. Let's say he is. How did he get the car to the drive-thru, Trevor? How does one order in a drive-thru? Do they get out and push the car from behind? Let's say he was drunk. Yes, let's say, since that is factually correct, beyond any shadow of a doubt. His intoxication level is incontrovertibly high. Undoubtedly high. The guy had no idea where he was and needed several minutes of jostling and yelling at him just to come to when he was asleep at the wheel. Yes, he was driving drunk. Right, so he's broken some law, a law not worth dying for. I think we can all agree on that. I, I actually agree with that. A law not worth dying for. Simply driving drunk and simply passed out at the wheel, presumably in park, not moving. Yes, you're right. You don't deserve to die for that. However... You cannot make that argument once you decide to resist arrest with both non-deadly and very quickly escalating to deadly force and then running away into the community while being a previously violent felon, by the way, with a potentially deadly weapon. That turns this case into a very clear justifiable shoot on behalf of the officer. The police approach him, and even then, I ask the question, why are armed police dealing with a man who's sleeping in his car? Because, Trevor, and again, available by viewing the video, some suspects and some criminals don't take kindly into take, being taken into police custody, especially when they have a long and storied rap sheet of violent crime. Another arrest on their record is not going to look good. When it's not going to look good and you have those extra circumstances, you may be willing to put up more of a fight than to simply cooperate in being taken into custody for your clear crime. He posed no threat to anybody. No one at Wendy's felt afraid. Cars are driving around him. He's not stopping people from ordering food. So Yes, he was. A another bold-faced lie. He absolutely was stopping people from driving through the drive through How else would people get around him? He's in the one-lane drive through and he's in park, passed out without a care in the world. Of course he was. So why are armed police there in the first place? Because some suspects have no regard with the force that they meet police officers with from even the simple questioning or the simple taking into custody. Again, up until his resisting arrest, despite his previous criminal record, Richard Brooks was looking at a DUI charge, and for all intents and purposes, he was going to be taken into a holding cell to air out once he can get a sense of who the hell he was and where the hell he was going or attempting to go. That's where he was going. He was going for a sleepover in a holding cell until he decided to make this violent. That's the question I think, like, these are all the questions we need to ask. Why? Why, 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 why? Why are armed police the first people who have to go and respond to somebody who's sleeping in their car who is drunk? Secondly, because drunk people, especially drunk previous violent felons, do not have the proper judgment and mindset about them to accurately judge who's talking to them, what threat they're under, and they do not have the proper faculties to assess the consequences of their actions. If you add up all these factors, the individual in question may very well think it more likely and more beneficial for him to get violent and to get physical, to get out of the current altercation with the police. Why do the police not give, I mean, the man says to them, I will walk home. If you protect- You don't get to walk away from your own crime scene. Plain and simple. ...and serving people. What is the true purpose of you not wanting people to drive drunk? It's that you don't want them killing themselves and other people. In this instance, no one has died because of his driving, and he hadn't killed himself because of his driving. Yes. 
Trevor, nice face, by the way, nice derp face. Very representative of the video. He hadn't hurt anyone or killed anyone yet, thank God. But that's also partially due to the fact that the police intervened. If the 911 call was not was not addressed or even made, who's to say he doesn't wake up in a half hour, still drunk, out of his mind, and pulls through the drive through What if some poor high school kid is getting off their shift and walking through the drive through lane to get to their car to go home, and this guy has no idea where he is, spaced out of his mind? Maybe he gets back onto the roads. Maybe some way, somehow, he finds himself on the old Dixie Highway hours away. It hadn't happened yet. If you look at his level of intoxication, he wasn't going to sober up or just around the corner. He was spaced. He was drunk as all hell. He was not even close to a level of intoxication or con- conversely, really, a level of sobriety where he could be expected to operate a motor vehicle safely. Not even close. And so as a police officer, maybe it's because I live in a utopian world where the police are truly just trying to protect and serve, not trying to write... You also live in a utopian world that does not inform us that blacks in America, specifically inner city blacks, taken as a whole, have a much higher rate of crime. More specifically, violent crime. And in particular, when compared to other segments of the population, violence towards police officers tickets not trying to get enough people arrested not trying to fill quotas no they're trying to protect and serve in that instance trying to trying to fill quotas or or write tickets this is not a parking violation he didn't park near a fire hydrant he didn't go 30 in a 20 mile per hour school zone the guy was drunk off his ass at the moment was incapacitated in his car but that's not to say he had no regard for the safety of others when he drove to the drive through He certainly wasn't, wasn't exhibiting any concern from, from other motorists on the road or people who could be walking on the side of the road or, or trying to cross the street when he drove to the Wendy's, drunk as all hell. So who's to say that he would have that same lack of concern and recklessness for those around him? Only this time, wouldn't be so lucky as to not happen to put anyone else in danger, not happen to harm anyone else with his drunk driving. Who's to say? You would hope a policeman would say, Sir, you do not look fit to drive. You said your sister lives around the corner. You said you live, let's take you, we'll take you home. No, we won't. We won't take you home because you have committed a crime. This is not a a passive kind of disagreement. This isn't even someone trying, you know, a lot of times you see it, especially in in bigger cities, when there's kind of altercation in the bar and there's a lot of yelling and and maybe even, you know, cursing and threatening. You kind of, you kick one of them out who started it, but no one's going to get arrested because he's not coming back in at that point. The, The threat has kind of been neutralized at this point, but that's, not the situation. And this, again, goes back to a narrative which we can cover in another video that why didn't the police just drive him home? Because the police don't drive criminals home. That's not what happens when you assess probable cause. Even if there was no probable cause, you don't just give the guy a lift home. And this is going back to a certain theory about policing and it's been popularized by a lot of people on the left. A couple of these people have been on shows like Joe Rogan's show and have really kind of spread this utopian, unrealistic, and I think unjustifiable view of the police force is that the American police force is not an after school program. It's not an Uber driver. It's not a turndown service. They're there to protect others, the other people who could be on the road if this guy gets back in the car. And the threat is not really even neutralized if you drive him home. 
he's still spaced out of his mind. Who's to say that once the cops leave, he gets right back in the car and goes back to Wendy's? He didn't get his food. You don't know. As long as the car is still there. Again, he's exhibited no conscience for putting others in harm's way by getting behind the wheel to get to Wendy's. So why would he just n not do it again once he got home? We didn't find you driving drunk. We found you asleep in a car. So we'll give you the benefit of the doubt. The country's burning down because of the way black people are, are dealt with by the police. So let us... No, it's being burned down because of the black community's response to people like you and people like you having the commentary that you do and having this, this ghost story effect on the black community. That's what can't be lost in a lot of this, is the black community does have a conspiratorial view of the police, and it's unjustifiable. But think again where they got that from. The majority of the parents and the school teachers and the people on social media and the people on TV, like Trevor Noah, their church leaders, so-called urban groups and black rights groups, all jam into their head for years on end during their formative years growing up that this is the state of affairs. Not backed up by any evidence, but you could understand how a, a young black man in America in his early 20s can come about that mindset. It's been jammed in his head since he was 10 or 12 years old from every supposed authority figure, both in his life and in public view, yeah, you're going to start adhering to that narrative, as incorrect as it is. Show you just in a moment that it doesn't always have to end the way you think it has to end. I'm not saying they had to do that, but it would have been nice. They arrest him. He fights. Now... You know what's messy about this whole thing is we forget you are dealing with a drunk person. You're dealing with somebody. The very fact that you're not allowed to sign a contract when you're drunk. The very fact that you're not, you're not allowed to do anything when you're drunk. And this, is, this is a specific point that I haven't seen a lot of people address in this video. I know that AIU went a little bit into this point that he was drunk. So we almost have to treat him with kids' gloves or, or give him... A different expectation for how he should be interacting with the police officers but it's explicit in American criminal law that your intoxication level does not forgive your crimes because the very obvious consequence of having it the way that Trevor wishes to have it is that it's absolute forgiveness for the crimes you commit while you're drunk it's a get at it's a literal get out of jail free card Whenever you want to be motivated to do a crime, just swallow a little liquid courage and you'll get off the hook. It, it's a very clear policy point for why intoxication does not get you out of being arrested and does not work at trial to get you acquitted. Tells us something about drunk. Do we know what a drunk person is in society? They're not going to do the logical thing. So as a policeman, if a drunk person does an illogical thing, what, like I feel like you should acknowledge the fact that they're drunk. It doesn't mean they... Again, along the timelines of events, even regardless of the fact that he's drunk, when is Officer Rolf supposed to no longer treat this as a bluff? You've had a very calm conversation with someone who was drunk, spaced out of their mind, and when you attempted to arrest him, he assaults you. Okay, you still shouldn't treat him as a threat because he's drunk. He assaults your partner. Still not enough of a threat. He tries to steal your taser. He tries to t steal your taser after yelling at him not to several times. He steals the taser. He, well, he's drunk. You can't do anything about that. He attempts to shoot your partner with the taser. Still not enough of a threat. He's drunk after all. He runs away with it, thus endangering the rest of the community. He's a fleeing felon now. If someone else were to stop him, or if another officer maybe on the beat down the road tries to stop him, 
Why do you think he has the taser? What do you think he's going to do with it? He's already demonstrated to two officers that he's not afraid of using it against people who are attempting to stop him from fleeing the scene. The intoxication level is irrelevant here. You're responsible for your own actions. And you making the decision to ingest a certain amount of alcohol before you commit a crime does, does not forgive your, your subsequent actions and is not a reason to get out of an arrest or to flee the scene or to assault police officers. It's simply not an excuse for your own criminality. They deserve to die. They're drunk. We know what drunk people do. I've been drunk. You've been drunk. Everyone has been drunk. You don't deserve Have you ever tried to assault a police officer while you were drunk, Trevor? I have not. I, that, I have not gotten to that level personally yet. Where I thought it was a good idea to swing on a police officer. That's a level of intoxication that I'm unaware of. To swing on a police officer and his partner, who are both armed, and then to steal their weapon and run away with it. That's a level of, intoxica of intoxication that I, I don't think I'll ever know. To die for being drunk. And if he didn't die because he was drunk. He died because he assaulted both officers with non-deadly force, then assaulted them both with potentially deadly force, and also decided to leave the crime scene, fleeing as a felon, again, with the possession of a weapon to inflict potentially deadly force on other officers, these officers again, or any bystander that may come in his way once he's escaped the scene. Police cannot respond or cannot handle a drunk person, well then, then they shouldn't be responding. If you responding to a person who's drunk means that person can be dead, the whole point of you going there was to make sure that people don't die because of whatever's happened. But if the people are going to end up dead anyway, then what's the point? Blur linear time. Just blur linear time. He was drunk and he died. All the moments in between do not matter to this man. And people say he shouldn't have risen. Yeah, he's drunk. I'm not excusing his but he's You are excusing. This is an eight and a half minute video of you excusing it. Drunk. In a situation like that, the sober person, in my opinion, the sober person, the onus is upon them to make sure the situation doesn't get out of hand. They were making sure the situation did get out of hand. That's why they questioned him calmly for over a half hour against the entire weight of evidence supporting a drunk driving charge. They still gave him the benefit of the doubt. How long are they supposed to let this criminality go before they call BS on him? Should they have both been shot by the taser? Is that, is that still not enough of a threat? And moreover, if he's already swung on both officers, he's already hit them both with the taser, say he incapacitates both officers. Who's to say that he doesn't steal their firearm? Why wouldn't he? He's already stolen one weapon off them. Now they're passed out after being tased. Why wouldn't he? You're sober. He's drunk. How are two sober men wrestling with a drunk person on the ground? How does it get that far? How does it end with him losing his life? Because he's a violent felon. That's how it ended, in him losing his life. He's a violent felon who attacks police officers, steals their weapon, tries to shoot them with it, and then tries to escape with it to inflict that same damage upon anybody who may cross his pass. And people always say the same thing. They go, well, you know, if you didn't do that, then you would still be alive. They say yes, that's absolutely correct. That's absolutely correct. Going back to what we said earlier in the video, if he had complied, he was going to air out in a holding cell. And then as far as criminal charges and its interaction and effect with his previous criminal record, that's to be determined. But as far as him being alive, if he would have just let those two cuffs go on him and get in the car, he would be alive today. But he didn't, he didn't do that. Intoxication or otherwise, he saw fit to fight back in a myriad of ways against both police officers. And this was the predictable and really justifiable result. 
all the time if you didn't do that. But the, the truth is, the ifs keep on changing. Oh, if you didn't, you didn't resist arrest. If you didn't resist arrest, you would still be alive. Or if you didn't run away from the cops, you would still be alive. Well, if you didn't have a toy gun and were 12 years old in the middle of a park, then- Tamir Rice was 12. No matter the fact that he was like 5'10 and a buck 60, and in cases of determining probable cause, you don't use consequential facts after, after the incident to support probable cause because people die if you wait too long without intervening. You would have still been alive. Well, you know what? If you weren't wearing a hoodie, you would have still been alive. Well, you George Zimmerman was not a police officer. This goes into the larger narrative that we don't care the Black Lives Matter. We don't care enough about those who die at the hands of the police unjustifiably. But isn't it a cut against that argument that we are relitigating cases like Michael Brown, who clearly tried to kill a police officer, more than once, also backed up by half a dozen black witnesses at the crime scene, and Trayvon Martin, who was not shot by a police officer and was only shot after he beat someone's head into the ground viciously and waited till he started to bleed out before he actually got the predictable outcome of that case, being shot in self-defense. Isn't it kind of cut against the narrative that we don't care about black lives, that most of the country is willing to relitigate these very clear cases from almost a decade ago. One case is totally inapplicable to the current situation in that no police was involved. And other cases like Tamir Rice and Michael Brown, there were very clear determinations of probable cause. Yet the entertaining and the relitigating years after it shows that we are willing to do our due diligence and revisit cases that really should be dead and gone at this point. They shouldn't be a blip on anyone's radar. You know, if you didn't talk back to the cops, you would have still been alive. If you What case is that from? What case is that from? Where you copped an attitude with the officer and now you're dead. This is a very conflation. And we're going to get into this when we wrap up the video here in a minute. This is not lazy. At the, at the beginning, we went over a, a simple alternative here that you can apply to people like Trevor Noah and the Young Turks. Lying or lazy? Do you know what the real story is and you're telling a different one anyway? Or are you too lazy to even give a crap to learn the facts of the case? This is lying. If you weren't sleeping in your bed as a black woman, you would have still been alive. There's one common thread beyond all the ifs. I'm not as familiar with the Breonna Taylor case, but I am familiar insofar as I have not seen a single person from the right justifying her death. Not a single person. But again, the conflation of cases that are unjustifiable with those that are justifiable is not only dishonest, is not only a lie, but unbeknownst to people like Trevor Noah, does a disservice to people who were unjustifiably killed. Walter Scott does not deserve to be lumped in with Michael Brown. Certainly doesn't deserve to be lumped in with Trayvon Martin, which is a totally different fact pattern. Breonna Taylor and even George Floyd don't deserve to be lumped in with Rayshard Brooks. But according to Trevor, they do... They are lumped together. They do belong in the same narrative because it's white cop on black suspect. That's it. End of story. If you weren't black, maybe you'd still be alive. Absolute total bullshit. Absolute total bullshit. Trevor Noah is a liar. This entire video was done knowing the facts of the case. He knew enough to know that that Rayshard Brooks was drunk at the beginning of the conversation. He knows enough to know that they had a conversation for at least a half hour. So he's at least familiar with the main video. So therefore, the conclusion that he died and he would otherwise still be alive 
because he was black, is an outright lie. He's familiar enough with the sequence of events and the chronology of this case to know that that is unsupportable by the evidence. Completely unsupportable by the evidence. Well, that's our show for tonight, but before we go, The Daily Show... This is a very sad state of events of events here. A very state of a sad state of affairs and and really the public's knowledge of basic civics and basic elements of policing in America. Look at this ratio. 7.3 to 1 in favor of those in the country who do not understand police measures, do not understand the criminality that police officers have to face, and the normal, everyday, calm conversations and circumstances that officers initially respond to, like in this case, that unjustifiably and unbeknownst to them at the time, be taken into physical altercations and potentially deadly altercations with the suspect. This is an absolutely, by the books, justifiable shooting. Rayshard Brooks tried on numerous occasions and succeeded, in some instances, in assaulting both officers, resisting arrest multiple times, stealing a weapon against the orders of the police officers, and trying to shoot both of them with it. And who knows what would have happened beyond that if the taser had landed on both of them. This is a clear-cut case of acceptable force used by the police officers. And the fact that both officers, especially Officer Rolf, is being charged with the charges, with the heinous crimes that he is, is absolutely unforgivable. Especially before the GBI investigation unit of the state of Georgia has finished their findings. This is a total miscarriage of justice, and we can only hope for the time being that both officers are acquitted, while people like me, like people who are like-minded and support the message and analysis of videos like this, while we chip away at the misinformation spreading across the country in terms of the American police force. This has been Fate of the Union. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye-bye.